sunshine today as you can see the another one of these cold spells are coming in we seem to have a hot spell and a cold spell and a hot spell and uh, as bad as that may be boy south of us in Ohio and Indiana those areas they uh, they're gonna get even worse we're following up today in our great adventure with how these two very nice uh, 22 caliber self pump uh, air pistols do uh, while well, we covered that part in the uh, in the uh, in an earlier video today we're going to see how they do after they've had some mods done to them let's find out because I have no clue on how this might end Both of these handguns, made by two different manufacturers, uh, have uh, a 22 caliber. They're both rifled. Uh, the Crossman American Classic has been around almost forever. And uh, this Humorex Strike Point has been a more recent uh, entrance handgun. But uh, we're going to see how they do. You know, something I learned a long time ago is uh, when the sun isn't shining, <laughs> that's the time when you need to be shining. Let's see if I can do that during this test. Now, I'm not trying to, I mean, I'm trying to hit the bullseye, but uh, what we're really testing here, because these guns haven't been uh, sighted in yet, they haven't been sighted in because I haven't done the mods to them yet, but uh, what I want to do is see just how tight the group is going to be. Uh, we'll be using this uh, chronograph to get an accurate measurement once the shots have been fired, and then again, after the mods, and I've shot again. Okay, now let's try the Humorex strike point. Uh, we're shooting at 10 yards and uh, we're using an equal number of pumps and exactly the same pellet. They're both rifled barrels. They're within an inch of each other. Let's see how they do. That was a long throw. This is the target that I was shooting at with these two guns with no mods. And it was this top left that I was shooting with the Crossman and down here is with the Humorex. Uh, a pretty good group, then one came out here. Uh, over here it's a pretty good group, but one came out over here. Not bad, and particularly with that Humorex uh, costing about $10 less. Now when I'm done with these, I'm gonna shoot this target with the Crossman American Classic, and I'm gonna shoot this plant, uh, target with the Humorex. Uh, Right point and then you can really see now we have a small problem and that is this crossman has been out a raw a, re a really long time um, before I get into these and what I have in front of me here 
some of you like a little humor. And I have to tell you the story behind the humor and how important humor is. It, it kind of balances out all the crap that's in life, you know what I mean? Uh, I uh, raced go-karts as a kid and in motorcycles. And I went to Spain for a special class on uh, uh, how to ride fast through the mountains. Uh, Europe uh, races motorcycles over there and it's just as big as uh, NASCAR is here in the States. So you, if you want to really learn some of the tricks, you go over there, and, and I did. And uh, when I came back, I had friends saying, teach me too. Ended up with about 20 people meeting at the Smoky Mountains, a little place called Silva, North Carolina, every spring. And we'd get in there early, <laughs> and a little bit of snow around, and certainly through the peaks. Uh, but uh, we wanted to, to use that place before uh, all the uh, vacationers showed up. And uh, one time I showed up with a couple of buddies a day early and we took on our motorcycles early and uh, we did something I'm, I'm not proud of and shouldn't have done, but we were going awfully fast. There wasn't a car out, out there in something called the Blue Ridge Parkway, etc., etc if you know that area. And uh, we were doing over 100 miles an hour. And what we forgot was while there were no police, <laughs> there was park rangers. And park rangers are federal employees. And when they write you a ticket, it's far more serious than a local police officer. And uh, they radioed ahead and, and set up a roadblock. And, and I was the first to pull over and they had more park rangers pulling over my two friends, all of who were going way too fast for that parkway. And uh, I just figured, well, it's going to be an expensive day. I mean, they can even impound your motorcycle right there on the spot. I thought this was a, a bad time to kick off uh, spring training, we called it. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this park rangers looking at the back and the license plate and I'm just sitting back figuring okay it's gonna be an expensive day and I I just happened to say would you like to hear a good clean joke <laughs> and he kind of muttered yeah and I said do you know how to turn a, a fox into an elephant and he kind of looked at me and he said how and I said marry the fox <laughs> He starts laughing, and he's laughing so hard, I don't get a ticket. My second friend did. It was over $500, and his wife was a sheriff's deputy, and he was an instructor at the FBI. The third fella took off on a dirt road, <laughs> got himself lost way up into the mountains, but he escaped seeing any officers up there. What really makes the story interesting was that as these 20 men merged in Silva at a Holiday Inn there, we, uh, I told the story and uh, there were three young guys, boy they, they liked to race, and they would run together and they're pulled over by the uh, North Carolina police officers. And when they did, one was a Chrysler engineer. <laughs> He hardly talks at all, and, uh, but he decided to talk while the officer is getting the three bikes lined up to write tickets. And he said, would you like to hear a good clean joke? And he told the same joke, and all three escaped a ticket. So I shared that with you just so you know, sometimes humor can go beyond anything you can imagine. Okay, now we'll talk about what we're going to do to these two air guns. Well, I purchased a number of accessories, particularly for the Crossman. And uh, as I got into the tune-up of that one, I found out I didn't need all those parts. And that's a good thing because uh, they were about 150 bucks and the gun was 50, so here I'm spending. And I just bought a small fraction of what's available out there for the Crossman. And uh, I, I could have done the important ones, the ones that are important to me anyway, uh, here without those parts. Let's start off with some tools though in the event that you decide to uh, 
do any of these alterations. Also know that one of the good things about this is you say, well, I'm, I'm never going to have that Crossman, I'm never going to have that Humorex. That's okay. There's some things in here that are going to help you with your guns. So let's take a look at these tools. Uh, I've got a lot of tools, but uh, I often use these uh, uh, little uh, hex heads, etc. cetera, uh, different size pliers, screwdrivers, a wrench, even a hammer and a punch, you'll see that. A tiny uh, uh, file setup, and uh, always a towel, which will keep parts, etc., from uh, running off of uh, the table. But you'll see here, I've got the uh, Humorex strike point here. I've also got the Crossman 1322 here. And let's see what uh, I'm doing with them. Um, I think, uh, first of all, you should know there's a lot of common things here. Uh, number one, let me take that off. Uh, number one, these two guns are very, very similar. Uh, I did the shooting outside and you saw that groups were both pretty good. Um, they're really good target guns for 10 yards. I suppose if you're an expert shot, maybe 20, and I think they can take some critters at 20. They're shooting at about 550 up to about 610 in feet per second. But because that's below the sweet spot of 800 to 1,000, and, and that's important here because it's when we go beyond that that we pick up a couple of really bad situations. Number one is that the pellets just don't fly straight. And if we see that 1,250, we get uh, one of the four sounds. I talked about the ping when a gun goes off near your ear, the, the inside mechanism. We talked about the pop when the pellet or BB leaves the barrel. The zing, and that's when this uh, air gun exceeds, or any gun exceeds the speed of sound. And then the, the stop when it, when it hits its target, which could be a thunk, it could be all kinds of sounds. One of the things I shoot at a lot is uh, the old cast iron frying pans, and that makes a nice bong. Uh, some of us are more concerned about uh, backyard friendly, others aren't. So I'm gonna kinda go through this uh, so that you can just make your own analysis, if you will. I'm gonna ask my lovely, beautiful wife, Dr. Paula, to come around and look inside uh, because this is very, very important. And you can see here that I purchased uh, a, a trigger setup. And uh, here's the old. I paid over $100 for this trigger setup. I could have used the old. All I really needed to do was to polish it up uh, with some compound, maybe a wire brush, and uh, smooth out some areas, and that would have uh, made it every bit as good as this one that's in it here now. I uh, purchased a, a spring. I took out this, this trigger uh, pull spring and uh, got this one. It was only about eight or nine bucks. But make no mistake, I've got all kinds of springs, and there's a ballpoint spring, and it doesn't work in either gun. Uh, but I do have a bunch of springs, and I probably have one in there that's like this one, and I could have substituted, saved another $10 there. I think you need to be very careful when you take these uh, grips off, and uh, particularly when you take this plate off right here. Uh, because buried right down there with this safety is a tiny, tiny spring and the smallest ball bearing I've ever seen in my life. And uh, that ball bearing, uh, gosh, if it goes zing across uh, your work area, you're going to have trouble finding it. And I, after about four times, I got tired of looking for the doggone thing. Uh, but that will help with this... Um, um, uh, safety which is right here and uh, 
just to look at a couple of other things I bought uh, this piece which provided two things and this was only ten dollars made by a 3d printer uh, on eBay but what this did was it stabilizes this barrel very very well and provides a Picatinny rail on top for a scope or red dot etc etc um, and uh, how do we get that on well right here this punch and that's why I have these punches here uh, to take this punch and a hammer and I knock it out and when you do notice that this entire leverage situation can fall and when it falls this whole piece comes out why would I want it out well uh, right here I want to put this on along with that front sight back and once it's on that pin can go back through this hole and uh, I can then screw on a moderator or just a flash suppressor. Uh, here's a very small Picatinny rail and I've got all kinds of Picatinny rails but uh, this can go back here on this back piece and it can allow you to put a really sophisticated costly uh, 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 rear sight, rear fixed sight back here if that's what you'd like. Um, so I found uh, as I got into this project that I could have saved a lot of money by just making a few parts myself. These very small washers I considered important because they go into this trigger and keep it smooth and um, the lighter weight uh, spring, and this one's very hard and strong, this one's very easy, it helps with that trigger pull. But let me tell you something else that helps with that trigger pull too. And you don't have to buy uh, any extra springs. But uh, I've often helped uh, soften up some springs by uh, just putting them in a big uh, pair of pliers. And you squeeze them several times. First of all, that really helps break them down. But when you hold it tight like this, it also helps reduce uh, that trigger pull some more. And so I've done that too. Okay. Um, again, once you get this off, we can see what really the air gun is all about. And this is all air guns of every make. But when we're pumping here, uh, a plunger goes up and down here. And when it goes up and down here, that's what creates the air. Now this big long spring, goes back here this again this is your larger tube on any air gun and this is called the hammer spring this is I believe much uh, more powerful than the one that's in there how do I get that out well I take out this screw that's right in here and uh, I uh, take out the screw up here and now this whole piece will come out I just switch the hammer springs and I get a a stronger hammer spring. Well, why do I want a stronger hammer spring? Because that hammer which goes back and forth here past that transport valve allows this air to go into the barrel and shoot and the stronger it is the longer it holds that hammer and the more air can go in picking up velocity. Now this Numerex uh, strike point let me just share with you what we're talking about here. Um, I found these, uh, I have these uh, little cone grinders and I have this rubbing compound and I don't know, I don't have the magnification that's required to determine if when they crowned the barrel, now the crown of the barrel is to in effect put a, a little funnel on it so that the uh, bullets, the pellets all leave without an issue. But this barrel is always a difficult thing to make. You got to drill a hole, you got to uh, run some rods through it that cut uh, rifling and lands grooves and, and whatever. And the cheaper guns will also have some burrs on these. And uh, you've got to get rid of them. So by using a rubbing compound and uh, a stone, something like these, uh, you can rub it and by hand, not with a drill, that's the job of the factory. 
but I, I put that in. Secondly, um, was this um, Picatinny rail. There was none. And there was an issue. It's a, a kind of rounded. Now, I plan to cut this uh, hood off, they call that hood over the front sight. But I happen to have, yeah, there's one you can see close. I happen to have one that has a groove too. This one was long. I needed a long one. And I was able to put it on with some epoxy glue. I had to use a, a, a number of things that would make sure that it was just as straight as an arrow and with that barrel. Because the last thing I needed was a red dot that wouldn't line up. And uh, I've used uh, scopes and red dots from dozens of companies throughout my lifetime. And currently, people say, where are you getting this stuff? And I, I get the scopes and red dots from CB Life. And uh, I plan to mount this here. And I will then have a, a gun. It, I know that the crown is smooth. I've got a Picatinny rail on the top for any scope type. And with pistols, I don't like scopes. They're just not uh, helpful. But red dots, well, that's what really what, what's go, what uh, they were made for, was handguns. So that's what I'm going to be doing with uh, this uh, Umarac strike point. Now some of this, I think you need to come real close to see what's going on. Uh, after removing these three screws right over here from these three spots, I've now uncovered the uh, entire trigger mechanism. Now, while we're looking at it here, I need to point a few things out. A lot of, a lot of uh, air guns say that you can replace this spring in the trigger with a ballpoint pin spring. As you can see, these are two totally different. And, uh, uh, the ballpoint pin spring is not going to work here at all. Uh, already there's some discolorization and this gun isn't that old. But I'll be replacing uh, this uh, sear spring right here with this spring. That's easy enough. Uh, I'll be replacing this sear with this one and that'll be uh, easy enough. I'll uh, probably be using some of these screws right over, not screws, but uh, washers over here just to keep it as smooth as possible. This is the new safety right here, and it's going to be replacing this plastic safety just underneath this tiny screw. Now that small ball bearing right there, that ball bearing goes between the spring and the safety. That thing fell out as I was unscrewing it. Uh, no big problem. I recovered it and uh, I'm ready to, uh, to utilize it as it was found. Okay, we got the new parts in and now we're gonna close it back up. But as you can see, here's the sheer, uh, the sear spring, the sear the trigger, the new safety the spring is down there and uh, now I'm going to uh, put this back in and uh, screw it in and this part will be done. Now why I'm uh, comparing these two pistols is they both look very different uh, and this larger one, the, the, the Umarex uh, 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 Strike Point, it's around fifty dollars, and this is uh, this Crossman's around sixty-five. Used to be forty dollars back in the seventies. This thing's been around for about sixty years. This has been around about fifteen. So it's a much newer gun, and uh, I won't get too much into it, but I will get some things into it just so you can see. If you look in there, you can see it's got uh, a lot of exactly what this Crossman has when you remember that this spring goes right here. 
so when I get this all taken apart, uh, I also saw that that this pump is extremely similar to this pump. And I'm not going to be a bit surprised when I take a look at the rest of these parts inside. So maybe Umarex waited until all the patents were dead and then certainly used all the good patents. In my initial target practice, the uh, Umarex was actually shooting a hair better. Um, it shoots about 60, 70 feet per second faster. But uh, once I make some transition changes here, it, uh, the power can be picked up. While we're talking about 550 to 610, I watched a, a, a YouTube video the other day. Somebody pumped these things up 50 times. Why is that significant? Well, you're supposed to cock these between 6 and 10. And he cocked it 50. He's going to rebuild the whole thing anyway, so he just decided what could we do? And when he did it, he got that thing very high in the 600 feet per second. He must have had a sore arm when it was over, <laughs> but it worked. Uh, let me just talk about, uh, while these are so similar, there's some big differences that I do not like at all. Uh, first of all, the Crossman gets brownie points because it had the better trigger stock and the pull was only about five pounds. And this Humorex, it was closer to eight or nine. Now I can, I'll get it adjusted. And the way you, you do that, of course, is uh, polishing and filing and getting this down and the spring tension down to something very small. Uh, but the trigger is a key part of any air gun. I think uh, the weight, or rather the barrel, the barrel length is very hugely important. I think the barrels are very similar. They're both steel, they're rifled. Umarex is in Germany, Crossman's in New York. And from best I can see, I think that they're very, very similar. And interestingly enough, both companies, big companies by the way, they both go to a company named uh, Lothar Walther, uh, uh, which makes guns, but they make barrels for everybody. And uh, you can get that type of barrel in a number of guns. So uh, they both go to the same company they recognize. This um, uh, Crossman has about an 11 inch barrel and the Umarex has about a 10 inch. I didn't see much difference. Like I said, I thought that right out of the box the Humorex uh, the shot a little faster and a hair more accurate. But let's talk about some differences. <clears throat> this Humorex is horrible for pumping. How you keep from getting your fingers trapped in there, I don't know. And the more that that's the case, the less you're going to use the gun. Now, something I didn't buy, and if I was all over again, I would have just made some of these parts, but I would have bought a new forearm stock. And uh, that would be one that's meatier, like the has more meat to it, uh, like the Umarex does, so that you can pump it easier and not get your fingers so trapped and, and caught in it. Um, so uh, there was a point for the Umarex brand. Both guns being in the $50, $60 category are often considered uh, entry level. Don't get too excited about them, uh, but they, uh, uh, they're entry level for young kids anyway. A problem with that is that while that may have been the initial targeting audience that both companies went after, we got a lot of old farts like me who get them and I've seen people spend three and four hundred dollars on them and think that they've done a bargain because with a 20 inch barrel for example uh, and a, a, a stock which I'm going to put on the uh, Crossman that they've literally gotten it way up to what it was originally but they're still short of what you can get in a, an air rifle. Um, that's interesting and there are some regulated air rifles that are in the $350, $400 category. So uh, I say we keep the pistol down cheap. If you can do some, some of these alterations for free, 
It's just some elbow grease. You might want to do that to save your money for the better gun. Remember now, there's some powder guns out there for six, seven hundred dollars that are phenomenal. I'll show you mine one day. I've got a, an M16 pistol. Pistol, I didn't say rifle, an M16 pistol. And uh, it's shooting those two, two, threes at about 3,000 feet a second. And if you want to hide behind a refrigerator, you didn't get yourself safe from me, that's for sure. So uh, uh, let's be very careful what we spend on guns. If you want a thousand feet a second, maybe you want a rifle. I think one of the interesting things that I saw uh, was that when you get pistols that only shoot 500 feet a second, and by the way, 500 is better than 350 and 450 than a lot of other air guns shoot at. Uh, but uh, when you, when you uh, uh, shoot at that low speed, uh, you're still way below this sweet point of when ammunition goes crazy. So that means with handguns, all handguns, you can transition over, if you will, to the, uh, the lighter weight and pick up speed there. I mean, if you're all about speed, you can get up to five, six, seven hundred feet a second. Not a lot of knockdown power, but uh, you can pick up that speed if you want. Uh, because you're shooting a low velocity gun. Another area that these two guns are not similar is in that front post. And uh, Crossman's front post is much better. This Humor X is much worse. I hated this hood, just hated this hood. And I will be using a Dremel tool and uh, some of these files right here. And I'm going to sand that down, put a little silicone on it, and take that hooded sight off. Now one of the things I've already done important uh, was to put a Picatinny rail on it and um, I found, uh, I don't have them here, but I have a bunch of Picatinny rails and I found one that's actually curved on the bottom instead of straight and uh, that's what I, I put here because this barrel here, this shroud, is slightly curved and I found if you look really close there you'll see that this Picatinny is slightly curved. I just lucked out on that one. So the shroud, other than that it has a good feel. It's probably, uh, if you like your handguns to look like some other handgun, I don't think either one of them look like a, a normal handgun too often, but uh, this might look a little bit like that 50 caliber Desert Eagle. Another area that Humorex failed, I think, is in this uh, uh, trigger shroud. There's not a whole lot of room here where you can take your finger and stick it in, and a whole lot more room with the uh, Crossman. So if you had gloves on, forget about it. I thought about cutting one section off and maybe smoothing this out a bit, uh, offering the trigger some protection but allowing a glove finger on. I'm just not sure yet what I'm going to do. Uh, but what I will be doing, and I do frequently with pistols, I'm all asked all the time, and I'm not a paid spokesperson or anything like that. I used to get uh, a lot of my uh, scopes, etc., from Field Supply Inc., FieldSupply.com. Uh, not today. I get everything I possibly can from CV Life. A lot of the stuff from um, uh, Field Supply was restored, refurbished. I don't have a problem with that. But everything from CV Life is brand new, nice box. And this happens to be a red dot. And uh, it goes right on to this. I've got a couple of my, perhaps once I get this um, uh, barrel shroud and Picatinny rail onto this, may do the same thing. Scopes, probably not. Uh, you still need your eye rather close to a scope. So I'm not real sure. I've never been happy with powder pistols with scopes. I really enjoy pistols of all types with a red dot. So I'll probably go in that direction uh, once I get these things uh, customized the way I like. Well, they're very similar. 
Uh, I hope that you'll follow some of the guidelines I gave. Have your tools ready. Have something that's not going to lose the springs or tiny ball bearings. Have a few tools. Enjoy the hour or two that it takes. And you'll have two great pistols to add to your collection. Okay, I've worked on those uh, two pistols. You'll recall the targets. This is uh, the uh, Crossman. Here are those five shots that I started with. And here are the uh, five shots of the Umarex. And now we'll see if all that tune-up helped. Doesn't quite look the same, does it? Uh, but uh, the barrel remains the same length. I did put a, a Donnie FL Tonto, Tonto on the end. And uh, of course this uh, uh, red dot on the top. A lot of work on the trigger and this stock. And I have to agree with a lot of people, this makes for a great uh, hiking gun, 22 caliber. Uh, I don't know that it keep a grizzly bear away, but it uh, it uh, came out pretty good. Now the uh, Umarex Strike Point doesn't have a tenth of the accessories out there. It's it's a, a newer gun, but as I open it up, you saw that a whole bunch of the insides is very similar. This gun's almost 50 years old, and. Uh, I'm guessing, I don't know, but I'm going to guess that Umarex waited till the patents were gone. They saw that this thing still sells great, and uh, so they brought out their strike point, which once you take the, the plastic off is very, very similar. It uh, shoots about 50, 60 feet a second uh, uh, faster. I, uh, I had to glue a uh, Picatinny rail on top, as you can see here. I I cut away that shroud that just hurt the fixed sight uh, uh, shooting completely. And like the uh, Crosswell, I cross <laughs> Crossman, I uh, put a, uh, a red dot. And uh, I currently am getting these scopes and red dots from CV Life, as you'll recall, they're all new. And uh, they give us a 50, us, me too, 15% discount. So for that, I'm very, very happy. Well, before I take a shot and find out if all that work uh, paid off, I'm reminded every time I take a pistol of a moment, two moments. The first moment was in the military. I was at uh, Officer Canada School. And one day of training was at the range in which Unlike shooting the M16 and, and uh, M79 grenade launcher and all the infantry handguns, uh, they had a slew of all kinds of world weapons because we could find them on, the, on the, the field and we needed to know how to break them down, we needed to know how to clean them and shoot them in the event that our own guns were out of ammunition. And that happened. Uh, that happened more than once because uh, Literally the moment we came under fire, I had a radio man and his instructions were to never be two arm lengths away from me. One, one was my arm length and one was his. And uh, as soon as the first shots were fired and I knew we had run into the enemy in the jungle, I was on the radio ordering more ammunition. Why? Well, when you're in the infantry and you're carrying it with you, you're lucky to carry about 13 or 14 minutes of ammo in a firefight. And that helicopter can take 20 minutes to get to you and drop ammo. So learning about the enemy's guns were very, very helpful. I'll never forget, I'm just taking these guns, I'm bored by then, I'm just shooting and taking another one and shooting. And then all of a sudden, this one handgun was beautiful. I'm telling a story that's uh, 40 years old, but it was smooth. And when you fired it semi-automatic, it seemed almost as smooth as a sewing machine. And I said, well, wait a minute before you take it away from me. Let me see what the heck it was I just shot. And uh, I remembered it. And uh, years later, when I got out of the military, I went to the gun store and I bought two of them. One for me and one for my dad. And I presented it to him, telling him why. That handgun was a nine millimeter 
browning and uh, oh it was pretty expensive but it was pretty I had brought back a Chicom pistol which I had taped to my chest here uh, I traded that for a shotgun I'm sorry I did that but uh, you do a lot of things when you're younger but uh, my dad had that when he died at just days from turning 101 a great memory just one of many with my dad okay let's see how these shoot before I start uh, shooting at the targets uh, you'll notice a suppressor here on the end and uh, I just want to shoot this to see what it sounds like keep in mind that suppressors don't silence a gun uh, you're still up with these both of these guns uh, somewhere in the neighborhood without a suppressor of 70 decibels and uh, what a suppressor does and this one did just that is it changes the sound and drops it a couple of points maybe 67 decibels but it changes it and that's the important thing so that it doesn't sound like a shot I use the story that if a boombox car drove by and it's thumping, thumping and sounding off and all the neighbors can hear it, we don't get alarmed. It's over a hundred decibels, and, uh, but they get alarmed with anything that sounds like a gun. So what we're trying to do is change it and that's what suppressors frequently do. Okay, let's see if all that work had any reward to it. Again, this was the original Crossman, and here's after an awful lot of work, went into the gun, a red dot, but I stabilized the barrel, as you can see here, uh, considerably, and I put a suppressor on the end, and uh, this barrel has been stabilized, not only here, but this entire uh, Picatinny rail is a stabilizing barrel force as well. And uh, that certainly helped. The barrel is still the same, but that uh, the guts in here were finely polished. And this trigger is not only metal, but notice that it's a trigger shoe as well as a trigger. And I like a wide trigger shoe. Uh, maybe others don't, but I do. And uh, you can buy just a trigger shoe by itself. It goes right on that trigger. I got the whole thing. Uh, I think my polishing and little filing did as much as buying a whole new trigger, but who knows. I did make it down to about a two pound pull and I like that. And uh, this tight, tight group here, right in the bullseye was by luck. Uh, that was between because I didn't tune these guns to hit right in the bullseye I was just tuning to make them a better shooter and that would that would come out as a, a better group uh, the, the crossman came out as a better group right in the bullseye that was by luck uh, down here the Umarex uh, had a, a, a good uh, uh, group and then after the shooting and keep in mind, I, I just polished the, the trigger and I did some things here and uh, used a red dot and tightened the group. Bottom line, I think that this sight in here, standard gun, at 10 yards, 15 yards, would kill just all the destructive critters that come onto your backyard as you might want. Same with the Crossman, has to be. Uh, uh, accurate right into that bullseye of course both of them uh, now this is very tight now we're talking about strictly headshots if you will I think this uh, Umarex is a headshot too it's not quite as tight as that one I've uh, I've measured it and actually it's it's almost uh, twice as wide as this um, but there was a lot more going into that gun it was a uh, compression spring it was quite a few things but it gave you a little idea and since these two pistols are 50 and 60 dollars they're really for entry level 
and uh, to spend a lot of money to get them here, I don't know, not for a 10 and 15 yard weapon. Uh, you decide that. Uh, I probably wouldn't do that again if, if uh, I was asked. Uh, to get nice groupings like this, I can get them out of a rifle, and uh, that's what I want to do. Let me tell you what was not done on either of these two guns, and that was that in tuning them, I didn't look for the best pellet that would come down in size. I just used a Crossman pellet for both. And uh, I can tell you these both would probably tighten up some if I had run five or six different uh, 22 caliber pellets through them. Uh, because they, they sling pellets a little differently. And, uh, but this kind of just shows you the improvement uh, using that same pellet. A little windier today, but we got out there anyway. Uh, crazy winter we're having here. Hot days and then cold days. Uh, thanks for joining us today for our 136th video. And uh, Dr. Paula and I really <laughs> were just plain amazed that you use us for one of your information resources in allowing your passion in air guns to be all that it can be, whether it's just to collect or whether it's to uh, target practice or shoot critters or large bore game or self-defense. And that's going to be our last video in this series on self-defense. And I've, I've shot enough people, I may have something to share with you on that. Uh, that'll be in the weeks ahead. Other than that, give us a thumbs up if you liked it, a thumbs down if you didn't. And certainly comment, ask any questions, and I'll, I'll help, uh, help you if you decide to go through these. Uh, one recommendation is that you not try to replace that safety uh, on this Crossman. Boy, that's a lot of work, and it doesn't help the gun at all. Leave the old one in, you'll be just fine. Until then, you have a good day.